Proverbs 23 and verse 7. Proverbs 23 and verse 7, well-known verse, but it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And I'm going to recap very quickly for a few minutes everything that I said this morning. But it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or another translation says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes. As we, whatever we meditate, whatever we spend our time thinking about, then that is ultimately going to start influencing our lives. And who we are and who we become can be maintained by the thoughts that we have. We saw that then in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 5. Uh, uh, Paul is speaking, he says, if you want to have a life of the flesh, then set your mind on the flesh. If you want to have a life filled of the Spirit of God, and we agreed that we wanted to have that, he said, then you needed to set your mind upon the things of God. In other words, he was saying, whatever outcome that you want to have in your life, if you want to follow God's plan for your life, or you want to follow another plan, both will do the same thing. It is this, you need to set your mind upon it. You need to be focused and put your attention towards that. Then we skipped on to Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, and it concluded that this, it says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you begin sowing inside of you, whatever you begin put inside of you, that is what is going to come out of your mouth. For so long you can pretend and we can make all these nice little theological words in front of people, but what is inside of you will finally come out. If you want to have faith-filled words coming out of your mouth, then what has to go inside? The Word of God. If you don't put the Word of God inside of you, then when the problems and the difficulties come, then the Word of God will not come out of you. What can come out of you is all that has gone in. Amen? And so if I want to change my life, if you want to change your life, if you want to be everything that God wants you to be, and we should want to do that, then we need to be putting inside of us everything that God needs us to know. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever I think about, I will begin to talk about. And so that led us then to Proverbs 23. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I cannot be anything different than what I will think about myself. If I have low self-esteem, if you have low self-esteem, if you think you are worthless and you don't have any value, it'll not matter who preaches, it'll not matter who comes to motivate you, you will hold yourself back. But if you get inside the Word of God and allow the Word of God to change you, amen, not another man, not your husband, not your wife, as much as they will want to do that, but if you allow God through His Word to begin to change you, then you can and will be all that God wants you to be, amen. And so I'll give you this illustration or this uh, little saying this morning, if you plant a thought, you will reap a word. If you plant a word, you will reap an action. If you plant an action, you will reap a habit. If you plant a habit, you reap a character. And if you plant a character, you reap a destiny. Now, I have to go through this quickly, but all of that was saying that God gave you over here a destiny. He's got a plan and a purpose for every single person in this room. And in order for you to know about your destiny, He gives you something. He gives you a thought. The pastor come and he prophesies over you. You hear a word of God and it stirs inside of your heart and you know that is for me. That is my destiny. That is what God wants me to be. You've got the destiny and you've got the thought. We spend a long time talking about destiny and we talk a, speak a long time about thoughts, but we seem to miss everything that is in between. The enemy will not necessarily fight the destiny and he doesn't necessarily fight the thought, but he fights something in the middle, and that middle is your character. You can be everything God wants you to be, but the enemy will attack your character to prevent you from being everything that God would like you to be. If I, I want to be a good pastor, I want to be a pastor that comes in love and says, every one of us, God has a plan and a purpose, and God needs us to do more, and this church does need to do more. We need to have this place filled. We need to, it's inside of my heart, we need to be out into our community and known inside of our community. Not just known by 20 Christians, but by known by a hospital. To be known inside of that Tesco that I know where that church is. Why? Because this is the place where people will be saved, healed, delivered, and set free. Amen? But we will not achieve that. 
We will not achieve that and we will not see it unless we work on our character. And the Bible is very clear on this. He exposes David. He exposes Solomon. He takes us through all of these great men in their lives. And he says, great men of destiny. And so they were. But God exposed their weaknesses and their weaknesses were in their character. And so we talked about this this morning and so it realized in Proverbs 4 and 23, uh, speaking in Proverbs 4, 23, it says, To guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. In other words, it was saying every area of your life, no matter what it is, every part of your life is tied up to your character. If your character is not in the right place, if your heart is not in the right place, then your destiny will not be fulfilled to its complete. But if you begin to guard your heart, you can and will be all that God wants you to be. We learned the word guard said if you have to guard something, it means somebody is attacking it. You don't guard something that somebody doesn't want to steal from you. Because you have an enemy, he comes to attack your heart, and that is why you have to guard it. I give an illustration this morning. It says, on a Monday night when we're going to bed, I take all of the rubbish from the house, I put it inside the bin, and I take it out to the curb, and I leave it. I don't look through my curtains all night worrying, is somebody going to steal my bin? Is somebody going to steal the rubbish? Is somebody going to come and hook through and see what I've had for my dinner? Because I hope they don't do that. But the, so why do I not care about that? Because it has no value. It has no worth. And it was discarded. But equally, there are gifts that I have bought for Joanna. And there are gifts that she has bought for me with my money. And, <laughs> and there's all these things. And we will call them valuable. You may not look at it and say it's valuable. But to us, it is valuable. I don't take those. I know I'm getting in trouble when I go home, but it's fine. Well, I take those gifts. I don't take those gifts and put them out in the street and say, there you go, come and steal them, take whatever you want. No, because they're valuable, we will lock them up in a safe or we'll put them away somewhere or they'll be with us. We will treasure those things. Why am I guarding that? Why is Joanna guarding it? We are guarding it because it is of great value and great worth. The Bible says to you to guard your heart. The reason why it says to guard your heart is because your heart, your character, who you are is of great value and it is great worth. If the enemy can steal your character, your reputation, your thoughts, your beliefs, and whether you trust God or not, if he can steal that, then he has already taken your destiny from you. Amen? And so he will steal it. So then we wanted to get on to a few things about uh, what are the things that God looks like? What are the conditions of our heart? What are the things that we need to change? What are the things that God will press on us the today? Well, you give an illustration that we were on heart surgery, that God was coming to get rid of the things inside our lives we didn't need to have. And so we only got through one this morning, getting as bad as my dad, not getting my sermons out. But anyway, we only got through one, and that was a hard heart. We give the illustration that says when you eat all the, the bad food for you, your arteries begin to block up. It begins to uh, put pressure on your heart. The heart would pump away. It's sending blood, and you're able to function. You've got your health. You've got your strength. But as you begin to eat all that nasty food and pour three layers of salt onto your dinner, it begins to clog up your arteries. Well, as it's clogged up your arteries, it's hard for the blood to get through. So the heart begins to beat faster and it puts more energy in to try and get the same amount of blood to flow. But eventually you block the artery. Eventually you block it and it doesn't matter how hard that heart wants to pump. It doesn't matter how hard the heart wants to push out the blood to help you. The arteries are blocked. The blood cannot flow and the heart is stopped and the person dies. And so is the same in our Christian life that when we are born again, we are full of compassion. We are full of love. We will help whoever it is. We will drive whatever distance we need to drive. We will spend time, whatever. We'll switch off the TV. We will do whatever we need to do. But life and circumstances, disappointments and frustrations and all of these things come and it begins to harden our arteries. It begins to block us up until we come to a place where we will no longer 
do the things that God has asked us to do. But there is hope, amen. I don't like to hit you and then leave it like that. There is hope. The Bible says in Ezekiel that he will take the heart of stone. He will take that calloused heart. He will take the heart that is shut off and doesn't see the pain anymore. And he will give you a heart of flesh. He will melt the heart again and he will bring the compassion back into your life. Amen. And so we need to look at ourselves and examine our hearts and say, God, if I have become hardened in heart, Lord, if my heart has stopped being compassionate to others, then Lord, forgive me and create in me a clean heart. Create in me a new heart. Lord, soften my heart again. Amen. And so we're going to move on to the second one this evening and we'll see it here in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And so the second one I want to talk about is an unbelieving heart. An unbelieving heart. That's what we need to talk about this, this evening because God wants to get us back to being a church that is believing. Amen. A church that believes in him. So this, this find it, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God, they first must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. I don't, I don't need to speak on this part long tonight because we get to hear about faith a lot in this church. And praise God, this is a faith-believing church. Amen. But it says, without faith, Without faith in our lives, without operating in faith every single day of our life, the Bible says it crystal clear, you cannot please God unless you are living a life of faith. It says why? When you come to him, first of all, you must believe that he exists. My neighbors don't believe that God exists. They don't want nothing to do with God. Neil, you're wasting your time. They'll go to work. There's people who say God doesn't exist. And ever they are deceived. Let me categorically tell you tonight without a shadow of a doubt, and I'm preaching to the choir, but that's okay. God does exist. Amen. God is real and he is on the throne and he is victorious. We must come to him, believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them who seek him. Well, Neil, I'm not sure about faith, and that's all a nice American stuff, and that's all Copeland and, and all of these guys. I'm not sure about that. How many of us are born again in here this evening? Amen. Put your hand up. Let's not be ashamed to confess it, because I'm also checking who didn't put their hand up, and then I'll be able to witness to them after the service. But we've raised our hands. How did we get born again? The Bible tells us in Romans in chapter 8 and verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth, and what? Believe in your heart then you'll be saved. Amen. Without believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, you couldn't be born again. So in order to qualify to be in God's kingdom, you had to have faith. You had to believe in God. You couldn't see him. You couldn't touch him. You couldn't feel him. You had no evidence to suggest that he existed, but he convicted and convinced your heart till you believed, and then you reached out in faith, and you received your salvation. Amen. And so so if we got born again and we became believers, and the clue is in the name, we became believers, then shouldn't our life from henceforth be one of believing, amen? A life full of faith, a life that says, I am going to trust God. But Jesus knows the obstacles that we would face, and he began to tell one day a parable to the people. And he talks about sowing the seeds. And the sower went out to throw a seed, and the seeds fell on the good ground, and the bad ground, the hard ground. We all know the illustration. And then he pulls the disciples aside, and he begins to explain the parable. And he says, one of the seeds is like people, when it falls and they hear the word, immediately the enemy comes to steal it, lest they would believe. In another one then he says, the seed was given. The people received it initially with joy. They believed it for a season, but then temptations, the trials and the testing came and they no longer believed. Anyone can believe when the times are going good. Anybody can believe when you've got health in your body. Everybody can believe when the bank account is full, you've received a new promotion and everybody loves you in work. Everybody can believe it when your wife is in the best form with you that she has ever been. Everybody can believe when the pastor is visiting you, everybody's high-fiving you and everyone wants to talk to you. Everybody can believe it then. But what happens when the test comes? 
What happens when the test comes? The Bible says that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength was not there. What does it mean? If we faint in the day of adversity, I didn't put strength inside of me. God didn't mess up. God didn't fail. Where was my faith? And I need to get the Word of God inside of me. How do you get faith? Amen. How do we get faith? The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Faith does not come by singing. Faith doesn't come by talking to somebody. Faith doesn't come by hearing a testimony. All of those things will encourage you. But the only thing to get faith is through the Word of God. I face situations. You face situations. I face difficulties. You face difficulties. I face times when I want to say, to part with this, I am walking away. This is not going to work. And you face the same thing if you're honest. But the difference between those who come through the challenge and those are the ones who don't come through it is when I'm going through a challenge, come and find where I am. I am locked inside my study trying to read this Word of God until God speaks to me. My mind will shout to me, you are an idiot. It is getting worse. It's a disaster. Nothing's going to work out. And I have to stay in this word until the word screams louder and says, your God shall supply all of your needs. He will make you victorious. And I have to keep hearing that word until I get a revelation, until I walk outside of that room, still facing the same situation as I went in, but walking out with faith inside of my heart. Amen. And I came to convince you tonight that God does not want you to live in doubt. He doesn't want you to have an unbelieving heart. How do I know this? In Hebrews 3, 12, he says it like this. He says, brethren, take care unless they be found within you an evil, unbelieving heart. How does God describe an unbelieving heart? He calls it evil. Why? Because what does an unbelieving heart say? God, you told me you would do this, but I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, God. So God, in other words, what I'm saying to you is, God, you're a liar. I don't want to be in a room when I'm calling God a liar. God is not a man that he should lie. God cannot lie. His word is truth. If his word says you will be healed, then you will be healed. If his word says he will meet all of your financial need, he will meet all of your financial need. But it doesn't always happen in our time. It doesn't happen in our time frame, but that doesn't negate the fact that God is truth and everything else is a lie. Amen. Faith is simply this, trust God. Amen. That's when I, when I go to my room and say, God, I've come to trust you. I've come to trust you and I get in his word until I trust. That's, that's one tonight. We need to have a believing heart again. Go back to your word. Spend time in the word. Stop spending time complaining and moaning and murmuring and talking to else go to the heavenly father and say god i can't leave this room until you talk to me and i guarantee you you will if you seek god with all your heart you will find him and he will put a word inside of your heart amen amen now that was all right so we might as well give you a hard one amen might as well give you a hard one that you think i need to shut off for a few minutes here and so the the next one i want to talk about is a proud heart a proud heart Neil, we are in Northern Ireland. We are living Northern Ireland. There is not a proud person we can hardly find. We are the complete opposite of pride. But we'll start off with pride anyway to, to understand this. In Proverbs in chapter 16 and verse 5, Proverbs 16 and verse 5, it tells us simply that God, he detests pride. It says here, well, we'll get to it in a minute. In Proverbs 16 and verse 5, For everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. I don't need to say much more than that. You cannot get much stronger to hear the fact that if pride is ruling and reigning in your heart, then God says, not you, but the pride that is inside your heart, that is an abomination to me. That is strong talking. That is Amen. That slapped me in the face when I read that. There's no escape in that. It is an abomination unto the Lord. Let's turn then to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 takes us a bit further. <coughs> James chapter 4 and verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
That's another sentence and a half. God opposes the proud. Anybody want God to oppose them? Anyone want God to be in opposition to you? Anybody want God to say, I'm going to stop you? I'm going to stop you in your tracks? I don't want to be living that. It says, but God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Or God gives faith or favor to the humble. In verse 10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. In another part of the Bible, I forget where it is now, but you can, you'll know it yourself. And it talks about there's going to be a supper. And he's going and says, go and invite everyone else out and bring them in for the supper. And then he leaves a, t- a seat at the very top of the table. And then someone comes to the top of the table and there they walk in. Man, I'm the main man. Everybody's delighted I'm at this party. The party's only got started now that I've arrived. And they bring themselves to the very front of the seat and they sit down. The host is there. The party's about to begin and somebody else walks in. And the host turns to the top seat and says, you wouldn't mind getting up off that seat there. And you wouldn't go to the back, please. And you who's sitting at the back, why wouldn't you come forward and take the honored seat? In other words, if we try to exalt ourselves, if we try to promote ourselves and think that we are the B's and E's and I've got it all together and am I wonderful and fantastic, then guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to be brought down. But if we are low, and I'll talk about this a bit better in a minute, but if we remain humble, if we remain humble, then the Bible says, God, he will exalt us. I would rather be at the back and the Father said to me, come on forward to the front, than to march on up to the front and, and be pushed to the back. Now, Neil, you say, well, there you go. Perfect reason. That's why I'm so timid. That's why I'll never do anything, because I am humble and meek. I am like Moses when he said, I was the most humble of all people. I will just lie back here. Well, in Romans in chapter 12 and verse 3, it says that man ought not to think more highly of himself than he ought to. We will jump on that and go, that's great. See, I shouldn't be proud. I shouldn't have pride in myself. But notice what he said. He didn't say you should not think highly of yourself, but he said you should not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. In other words, you can still begin to think well about yourself. The problem in Northern Ireland is this, is that we don't think well about ourselves. We think that everybody else is the B's and E's. We think everybody else can do it and everybody else has got a talent. Everybody else has got an ability, but we look to ourselves and say, woe is me. I was at the back of the queue when God gave out talents and he ran out and I didn't get a single thing. Oh, I couldn't do this. I couldn't sing. I couldn't preach. I couldn't testify. I couldn't witness. I couldn't lay hands on the sick. I couldn't do this. But isn't that great? I'm being humble. The Bible said to think highly of yourself, but not too high of yourself. It's okay to have a good self-image. Amen. It's good to think good about yourself because if you don't think good about yourself, well, then who is going to think good about you? Think good about yourself, but recognize this that God is your source. You've got a talent. I guarantee you every single person in this room has a talent, but you didn't get it by yourself. Oh, you can develop it. You can practice it. You can use it and, and make it better. But who gave you your talent and ability? God gave you that talent and ability. Now I want to give you a story uh, from Daniel, Daniel chapter 4. And uh, here we're going we're gonna to talk about a king very quickly. King, King, Keb- and now that was how I'm going to pronounce his name. King Nebuchadnezzar. There, I nearly said it right the first time. King Nebuchadnezzar to all, this is him. He's about, he's the king of Babylon. And he's about to start off well. This king is starting off good. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all people, to all nations, and to all languages that dwell in all the earth. He's saying, if everybody, I want you to listen to what I've got to say. Peace be multiplied to you. It seems good to me as the king to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Isn't that good? That's a good start. He's saying that everything that I've got, it came from God. It was his might. It was his mercy. It was his power. He was the one that did it. 
And by praising God, this is what happens in life. In verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I was at ease in my house, and I was prospering in my palace. That is nice. I like that sentence. I want to be at ease and prospering in my palace. And how do I do that? When I give God all the glory. Well, he started off good, but praise God for the Bible that it's real, and it lets us see people's characters and how his character changed. And we see in verse 29 then, at the end of 12 years, no, nope, doesn't say 12 years, at the end of how long? 12 months. 12 months ago, King Nebuchadnezzar, King, your man, the king, he was, he was praising God but 12 months down the line, what's he doing? At the end of 12 months, he is walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king says, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Hang on a minute. Let's reverse and think about this. He was saying that God had built it. This kingdom is to God's glory. But enough people have come along to the king and said, King, look what you have done. Man, nobody can do it like you can do it. Everybody else could have had their kingdom, but only you could have built a kingdom like this. And he allowed the compliments of the day and all of the praise of man to come to him until now he's walking along his rooftop. And he's looking at his might and his power, and everything that he looks, he goes, man, look what I've done. And doesn't this just show what a great king I am? In verse 31, and while the words were still in his mouth, while he's still congratulating himself and thinking, you are the best thing ever to walk this earth. While these words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. In verse 33, immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. He ate grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as the eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. This is not a good place to be. He changed his attitude. He changed his character. There was nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong of having success in your life. But when you get to the point of believing that it is me and it is my talent and it is my abilities that has got me here, then you begin to look at others. You critique them. You put them down. And everybody else becomes lower than you. And you become haughty in heart. And so he repents. Amen. The story finishes good. He recognizes the error of his ways and he repents. And in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and extol and honor the King of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And look at this. He learned the hard way. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now, I didn't come today to tell you that God's going to pull you down. He's going to strip everything off you. No, but we know this a wise saying. It's also in Proverbs that pride comes before a fall. I don't want you to fall. I don't want you to miss the mark. I don't want you to do so well in God and God to promote you in the kingdom and then for us to make a mistake and to slip upon our face and to lose it all because pride enters our heart. Why does God detest pride? What is it about pride that God says, that is an abomination to me? Because look at the words you begin to use when pride is in your heart. A simple little poisonous word is this, I, 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 I. Or we can grow it a little bit, me, me, me. And I used to wear, I had a t-shirt once, it was me, me, me. It was a great t-shirt, I liked wearing that. But anyway, I don't know where that came from. But anyway, so, so why does God hate it? It's because we get so filled with pride in our heart. In Psalm, it's just come back to my head now, I can't think, I think it's Psalm chapter 10, but it talks about a man who is full of pride. His thoughts are only upon himself and there is no room for God. What happens when you get pride? God, look what I'm doing. I'm doing this. I'm running here. I'm doing that. I've got the adulation of the crowd. Everybody loves me. I'm a people pleaser. I'm trying to do all of these things to do this. God, I haven't got time for your ways. My ways are working just fine. I've built this baby. Look what I've been able to do. And pride takes us to a place where we become independent. 
independent from God. God, I don't really need you anymore. Thanks for the kickstart. Thanks for getting me on this road. Thanks for giving me this talent and ability. But I've been able to do this by myself. And look where I've got it. And God, I don't really need you anymore. Pride before the fall. You don't believe me? Read the Bible and find it. I'll give you one illustration. His name is Lucifer. He has it all. He is in heaven. He's at the very throne room of God. He is the chief musician. He is the worship leader, the hardest people to control in the world. Yeah. Uh, and so he's the chief musician. He's the worship leader. And he has it all. And God is using him in a mighty way. But something enters his heart. And there he is in heaven. And what does his attitude begin to become? Well, why are they worshiping him? They need me. If it wasn't for me and all this wonderful melodies that I can play, God needs me. I will exalt myself. I will lift myself up. I will be like the Most High God. And pride enters his heart. And what did the Bible say? And behold, I saw him fall like lightning. Pride came and he fell. You don't need to fall in your life. Don't allow pride to be there. Pride is when you're independent from God, but humble says, I am dependent upon God. I recognize I've got talents. I recognize I've got abilities. I recognize I'm not a bad fellow after all, and you're not a bad person after all. I recognize I'm doing all right, and you're doing all right as well. But recognize if God was to walk away from us, then what would we be able to do? But the word declares he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. And that is we need to be dependent on upon him. I'm going to wrap it up now. And so we saw we need to have, not need to have a hard heart? What do you need? You need to start preaching this to yourself. We don't need to have a hard heart. No, if we've got a hard heart, it's got to go. We've got to have a heart that is full of faith, a heart that believes God. I've got to have a humble heart, a heart that no matter when things are going well and success is overwhelming me, it says, God, you are the one who has given this all to me. And I want to convince you then, well, what is a good heart? What is the right heart? It's no sense just telling you what is a bad heart, but what is a good heart? Or why would I want to have a good heart or live the right way? In Matthew chapter 5, it's the Beatitudes, and it says, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, are those who have the right motives, the right attitude, the right character, those who are ones who are living a good relationship with God. Those are the ones who examine themselves and live the best they can before their Father. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. I don't think it just means literally see God, but I think it means this, that you would see God operating in your life. If you allow God to say to you, that area, I want to change. I want to mold and fashion and renew and change you. And if you will allow me to do it, if you will make the changes, then see what I will do in your life. Amen. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, it begins to talk about it sows the good seed. And if you have a good heart and the seed falls into the good ground where there's a good heart, then you will produce much fruit. Amen. So I didn't come to condemn this week. I didn't come on two services to say, well, and look at these bad things inside of our heart. I came to point out the things that are making it a rocky and a stony ground that is preventing me and preventing you being all that God wants us to be. God has come to say to us today that there is more for each and every one of us to walk in. No matter how blessed you are today, there is more. No matter how healthy you are today, there is even more health for you. There is more wealth for you. There is more ministry blessing for you. If you have seen 20 people born again, you haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg. More people can be born again through your life. God, if you, God has, God's thoughts are greater than our thoughts. His ways are greater than our ways. And he's saying to you, even if you're comfortable with your ways today, there is more that he wants you to do. There's more that he needs you to do and says, make these adjustments. Allow me to fill your life. Allow me to overwhelm and fill and flood your life. Allow me to operate and let's begin to have that adventure. Let's see what we can do when we are completely sold out to him. Amen. Amen. Do you receive that word this evening? Amen. Amen. Well, let's just stand to our feet this evening. So, Lord, I just thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that I didn't come to entertain. 
I didn't come to make a name for myself, but I came to give your word. And your word, Lord, was that you were examining our hearts. So, Lord, it would be naive and it would be wrong of me to not give everyone an opportunity in this very moment in your presence to examine our hearts. Lord, people have come here this evening because you have called them. You have brought them in here and you have their ar your arm around them this evening and you're speaking to each and every one of us to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my beloved. But I'm whispering into your ear and I'm talking to you to, about a part that's inside your heart. The things that you've pushed away and the, the things that you've just haven't dealt with. And the Father's coming to bring them to your remembrance again that says, Let's begin to remove it. Let's lay aside every weight, every burden, everything that would hold us back from being all that I want you to be. Why don't you this evening bring that thing before your mind and release it over to the Father to say, it's held me back too long. It's held me back, this character, this trait, this habit, all of these things that are preventing me being who you want me to be. Father, would you take it from me? Lord, would your grace come and overfill me and flood my life? Would you come and repair? Would you be the surgeon this evening? Would you go deep inside my heart this evening, Father God, and heal the brokenhearted, heal the wounded heart, heal the doubting heart, Father God. Speak faith into the doubting heart. The hard heart, would you soften again? Would you put it upon the potter's wheel and begin to form and to uh, fashion and to begin to mold it again? Lord, would you take the proud heart, the heart that thought they could do it by themselves, and say, Lord, it was you all along. It was you all along. And come back to being dependent upon him. Lord, take our hearts, renew our hearts, create a clean and a pure heart inside us this day. And Lord, I thank you in advance for the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the great things that will happen through this people, Father God, for they have turned their heart to you. Their ears are inclined to you. Their eyes are focused on you. Their hearts and characters are turned to you. And they're reaching out to you, Father God. And take us by this hand and lead us through this life. And let us be warriors and champions with you. Let us be conquerors. And let us see this nation one for you. Let us see the blind eyes open and the deaf ear to hear, the lame to walk, Father, and the poor to be made wealthy, for the sick to be healthy, for the hungry to be fed, and for those that have no hope, Father God, to be anchored in you, our hope and our refuge and our strength. I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you thanks for you're a great God, and I praise you. And Lord, we just pray, part us with your blessings. Bring us back next week to be in your word, to worship you, and to come in here with a heart full of adoration and worship to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray this. Amen, amen. God bless. <laughs>